Good evening, I'm Judy Woodruff on the News Hour tonight. As the U.S. and Iran trade accusations over damaged oil tankers in the Persian Gulf, a look at what Iran's strategy may be in this tense moment. Then it's Friday. Mark Shields and David Brooks are here to analyze President Trump's controversial comments about receiving foreign intelligence on political opponents and preview the upcoming Democratic presidential debates. Plus, a second life for a southern juke joint. How Clarksdale, Mississippi became a boom town by embracing its legacy of blues music. It's just really winding down. You can almost just see it winding down. So it's kind of like, well, you make it reliable, I can bring you tourists, blues fans. But they're not going to spend the night in Clarksdale if I can't promise them you've got music tonight. All that and more on tonight's PBS NewsHour. Tensions are still running high in the Persian Gulf region's troubled waters, a day after two tankers were attacked. The U.S. military has released video that purportedly shows Iran's Revolutionary Guard removing an unexploded mine from one ship. U.S. officials says it is clear that the Iranians were trying to remove evidence, but Iran denied any involvement. We'll explore all of this after the news summary. President Trump today walked back a bit from saying that he might not tell the FBI if a foreign government offered, quote, dirt on a political opponent. He had made the original statement in an ABC News interview. He was asked about it again today in a Fox News interview. I don't think anybody would present me with anything bad because they know how much I love this country. Nobody's going to present me with anything bad. Number two, if I was, and of course you have to look at it because if you don't look at it, you're not going to know if it's bad. How are you going to know if it's bad? But of course you'd give it to the FBI or report it to the attorney general or somebody uh, like that. Democrats had condemned the president's initial statement as inviting foreign interference in U.S. elections. President Trump also says that he will not fire White House counselor Kellyanne Conway despite a government watchdog agency's recommendation. The agency says that her criticism of Democratic presidential candidates has violated the Hatch Act. That law bars government employees from engaging in political activities. The president rejected the finding, saying that Conway has the right to free speech. On another staffing issue, Mr. Trump said he plans to name Tom Homan as his new border czar. Homan was acting head of Immigration and Customs Enforcement from January 2017 until retiring last June. He has since been a contributor to Fox News. In Hong Kong, pressure is building to scrap a bill setting up extradition with mainland China. The bill has sparked mass protests, and police are bracing for more this weekend. But today, several former senior Hong Kong officials sided with the protesters. What the people are attempting to tell this government is that we are very worried about the consequences of passing the extradition bill because no one will feel safe even in their own beds uh, after passage of this bill. Uh, it places everybody's individual freedom and safety at risk. Some members of Hong Kong's governing cabinet also call today for delaying action on the legislation. South Sudan is warning that a record number of people face hunger and potentially starvation. In a new report, the South Sudanese government and the United Nations say nearly 7 million people are at risk. That is more than 60 percent of the population. The report blames delayed rainfall, an economic crisis, and the effects of a five-year civil war. Women across Switzerland went on strike today to demand equal treatment. They walked off jobs and blocked traffic, carrying signs and chanting slogans calling for fair pay and an end to sexual harassment. It was the first such protest in Switzerland in 28 years. It's a historic day because women, whether they protest normally or not, need to be heard. Things need to change. We are the majority of this country's population, but we are still not listened to enough, not present enough in decision-making jobs. 
women in Switzerland make an average of 12 percent less than their male counterparts. For the first time, a woman will lead the U.S. Navy's War College. Rear Admiral Shoshana Chatfield was named today as the school's new president. She has led a U.S. military command in Guam since 2017. Rear Admiral Jeffrey Harley was removed as the War College's president on Monday amid allegations of excessive spending and abuse of hiring authority. Hundreds of thousands of people marched and celebrated in Tel Aviv, Israel today in one of the world's largest LGBT pride parades. Participants waved rainbow flags, walked with colorful balloons, and danced on floats. Some called for Israel to drop curbs on same-sex marriage and parental rights. On Wall Street, stocks failed to make any headway on this Friday. The Dow Jones Industrial Average lost 17 points to close at 26,089. The Nasdaq fell 40 points, and the S&P 500 slipped four. Still to come on the news hour, what will Iran do next as tension grows in the Persian Gulf? An inside look at the training school districts undergo to prepare for mass shootings. The three million lives at risk as Syria's President Bashar al-Assad steps up his bombing campaign and much more. The suspected attacks yesterday on two oil tankers near the strategically vital Straits of Hormuz ratcheted already high tensions between the U.S. and Iran to a new level. And global reaction has varied in markedly different ways. The United Nations Secretary General called for an independent investigation. President Trump says the U.S. knows Iran was responsible. Nonetheless, today he expressed interest in talks with Tehran. Japan's Prime Minister Shinzo Abe condemned the attacks, one of which hit a Japanese-operated tanker while Abe was in Tehran. And Iran's President Hassan Rouhani accused the U.S. of radicalizing the situation in the region and pursuing an aggressive policy against the Islamic Republic. At the Pentagon today, Acting Defense Secretary Shanahan had this to say. We have an international situation there in the Middle East. It's not a U.S. situation, and the focus for myself and Ambassador Bolton and Secretary Pompeo is to build international consensus to this international problem. We take a closer look at what is at stake and how Iran might respond with Rule Mark Garek. He was a CIA operations officer in the Middle East in the 1980s and 90s. He's now a senior fellow at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. And Vali Nasser, he's a Middle East scholar who served in the Obama administration State Department. He's now the dean of the School of Advanced and International Studies at Johns Hopkins University. Although soon he will step down from that job in order to advise Democratic presidential candidates. And we welcome both of you back to the news hour. So my first question to both of you is, do you accept the Trump administration uh, uh, ex uh, insistence that this was Iran that was behind these attacks, Fali Nasser? I think more than likely, yes, although we have to see the final proof and the administration will do well to provide uh, irrefutable proof. But I think uh, more than likely Iran did it. It happened in a way that provides them with uh, plausible deniability. And now there actually is a very interesting situation where the debate is about whether they did it rather than about what are the ramifications and what signal they were trying to send. Do you believe the, the administration is correct in saying it was Iran? Yeah, I don't think there is any plausible candidate besides Iran. The Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, naval units have a long history of training and using mines in the Persian Gulf. So I think it's pretty conclusive. So why are they doing this? Why did they do it? Well, I think there are a few reasons. I, I think most importantly, they're trying to uh, spook the Europeans, the Japanese, and others. Uh, they're trying to send a signal to put pressure on the Americans to sort of back off. Uh, I think they also enjoy it. I mean, I think there's a certain fillip of revolutionary pride here. Enjoy it? Yeah. I think they've, they've been under tremendous sanctions pressure, and they wanted a means to strike back. They can't strike back directly against the Americans because they know that would be, I think, suicidal. 
So they go after others, they go after peripheral targets. And I think it gives them considerable satisfaction as well as they hope achieving a strategic goal of getting everybody worried that uh, chaos might break out, war might break out, and uh, the Americans will be put in a tight spot. And Valley Nasser, what do you see as the motive here? Well, I think uh, Iran is, wants to show that it's defiant, that maximum pressure strategy of President Trump has not worked, and that they are also capable of uh, resisting the United States and also escalating cost. And in particular, if the, this president does not want to go to war, Iran acting rashly, uh, threatening escalation, could essentially turn the tables on the president. But uh, I also think that uh, Iran cannot go to the table with the United States looking like it's surrendering, like it's capitulating. So given that uh, Prime Minister Abe was in Tehran, everybody was expecting that he had carried messages from President Trump and may bring messages back. I think the Iranians wanted to send a message both to domestic audience and international audience that regardless of what Abe brought, brought to them, they are nevertheless are going to be defined. And this is not going to be easy for the United States. So Rule Garak, does this bring Iran closer to what they want? Do, do these attacks do that? Well, it, it depends. I think it depends in part on whether how the United States responds. I think it's eventually uh, the United States is going to have to prohibit them from using mining, mining operations in the Persian Gulf. I think the U.S. Navy is going to get quite cranky about this. If you recall, uh, it was a mining attack, a mine attack in 1988 that led President Reagan to authorize the U.S. Navy to essentially destroy much of the Iranian Navy. So I think the U.S. Navy is inclined to become much more aggressive if the president authorizes it to prevent this type of action. I, yeah, I, I agree with Vali. I think there is also a predicate being laid for possible uh, negotiations, possible diplomacy. I think the uh, regime is in a very tight spot, and they will perhaps try to find an out with the Trump administration. They may not wait until 2020 to see if the Democrats win. Well, it, well, where do you see that going, Valley Nasser? Because on the one hand, the administration has had this maximum pressure, the Trump administration, maximum pressure. But on the other hand, you hear them saying, we would, the president saying, we would consider talking to them. It, it, how do you see that coming about or not? Well, I think at one level, the, the purpose of maximum pressure is not clear. So the, there are elements of the administration who would want either regime change or for Iran to completely capitulate. And then the president in Tokyo said Iran can prosper under the existing regime. And what I really want is, is to talk to Iran. So I think the United States would do well if it had a clear uh, strategy and it would signal it properly. But I agree with Rule that Iran is in a tight spot. They don't have an option of going to war with the United States. That would be the end of the Islamic Republic. They cannot suffer on, under these sanctions as is. And they ultimately may have to come to the table. But it's going to be a very delicate dance of how they get themselves to the table. And we saw some of this with Kim Jong-un and North Korea, that beating their chest, being threatening, is essentially might be a, a sort of a way to come to the table. And we shouldn't forget that you know the prime minister of Japan did not go to Iran without at least having some indication that the Iranians would like to hear proposals from the United States. And it's quite possible that he's carrying back at least certain conditionalities and proposals from Iran. So the public messaging between the two sides may, as rules say, may be providing a sort of an umbrella or a cover for some kind of an engagement that might be forthcoming. So it's counterintuitive, but, but are we saying that the maximum pressure campaign, which may have caused Iran or pushed them into a corner that made them want to do this uh, rule correct, then, then may in turn lead to talks? Is that what we're, is that oh, what it's, it's, an, it's entirely possible. I mean, it, again, I think it depends what the Iranians do. They're creatures of habit. So uh, since we haven't responded yet to their provocations, and I think in retrospect it was probably a mistake that we didn't respond to the attacks off the coast of Fujairah where there were four ships damaged, if we'd been more bold then and said... This, this is what happened a few weeks ago. Right. If we'd been more bold and said, you do that again, we're going to unloose helicopter gunships on the Revolutionary Guard Corps and Navy, this might not have happened. So it depends whether they return to these tactics. I suspect they might. In which case, the, I think the U.S. Navy will have to become more forceful. That could derail or delay the process of the, for the regime if it really is trying to find an avenue 
to have negotiations with President Trump. But very quickly, right now we are still waiting to see a clear response from the Trump administration. Is that right? Uh, absolutely. And also we don't know exactly what Prime Minister Abe brought back and what is related to the president. And I think rule is correct. I think both sides need to show, a, show decisiveness as they are perhaps pr uh, trying to go to talks and gain leverage. But this is exactly why it's dangerous. It can get out of hand, and, and one signal or one escalation may, may, may essentially lead to somewhere where neither country, I think, would want to go. And in the meantime, you had the acting defense secretary, Shanahan, saying, talking today about an international reaction. So we'll, we'll wait to see whether that uh, comes together in some way. Rule Mark Gorecht, Bally Nasser, we thank you. Thank you very much. With an increasing number of school shootings across the country, school boards and administrators are struggling with how to prepare for the worst case scenarios. As John Ferruja from Rocky Mountain PBS in Denver reports, Colorado has become a center for developing school safety protocols that have been adopted in many districts throughout the U.S. Walking the halls of Platte Canyon High School in Bailey, Colorado is always bittersweet for John Michael Keyes. It is here he lost his daughter. In 2006, a lone gunman, a stranger, got into the school and took students hostage in a classroom. All got out but one, Emily Keyes, and she sent this last text message to her parents. You know, Emily gave us a voice, and she also told us what to say. I love you guys. It is from here that an idea emerged, a plan, to save the lives of others. I realized that there wasn't a common language and common expectations of what to do in a crisis around the country with our schools. And we found a handful of districts in the country that were using some very specific language in their crisis response. And we packaged it and relabeled it and called it the standard response protocol. The I Love You Guys Foundation, started by John Michael and Ellen Keyes, trains hundreds of teachers, administrators, organizations, and agencies every year to expand the reach and scope of the program. We took lockout, lockdown, evacuate, and we added shelter. And those are the four actions of the standard response protocol. We found the standard response protocol in 2009. It changed our lives. And that was John Michael. That Keys. was John Michael Keyes, uh, the I Love You Guys Foundations. John McDonald heads security at the Jefferson County School District. This is the district of Columbine High School, where in 1999, two students killed 12 fellow students and a teacher before killing themselves. McDonald and his team, working closely with local law enforcement, are focused on keeping kids safe in schools. He oversees the Frank DeAngelis Center, which was once an elementary school. It is named for the former Columbine High School principal, Frank DeAngelis, who now speaks across the country about the lessons learned from Columbine. This thing is ballistic protection. At this training center, school districts and law enforcement agencies from across the country can train for the worst. In the past year, we've had over 60 agencies, more than 6,000 police officers, sheriff's deputies, state and federal agents training in here preparing for that given day. The goal is making sure a responding officer, even if working alone, understands the tactics that can help stop a shooter who gets into a school. 32, I got one party down, no movement in room number one. This is a state-of-the-art, computer-controlled, virtual reality shooter training. Gun! Officers can be run through hundreds of scenarios involving a gunman in one room or in several rooms. It really provides our professionals the ability to go into an environment and train just like they would have to respond using multiple rooms, uh, noise. But this is just one part of the school safety equation. Another component is how schools immediately respond before law enforcement arrives. Get everybody inside, we're gonna lock those outside doors. That brought John Michael Keyes with program in hand to Jefferson County. He came to me, sat down in, in our office here, and I said, how much? He said, I don't, I'm not gonna charge you anything. I just want you to try it. Call him back the next day, I said, I don't believe in testing it, we're gonna implement it. We started training on the standard response protocol in all of our schools, and it was battle tested that year. In February of 2010, three weeks before our Deer Creek Middle School shooting, we first went into that school and trained and talked to the teachers and the administrators about what they'd see, what it'd feel like, what they needed to think about. There he is, there he is. 
On that day, a mentally ill man shot and wounded two students outside Deer Creek Middle School before being tackled by a teacher and subdued. I support this program and have for many years. And that is why John McDonald is often right alongside Keyes, helping to train the standard response protocol. I believe it to be the fundamental program that we base all school safety on here in this district and so many districts across the state of Colorado and now across the country in Canada. The I Love You Guys Foundation has mapped where school districts are now using the standard response protocol and the list continues to grow. But despite their efforts, John McDonald says there are still huge gaps in school safety training across the country. There are no national standards, there's no state standards, there's no local standards other than what we decide and determine and, and, and that's a struggle, frankly. That, that worries me a lot. For Jefferson County and many other school districts, student and staff training and law enforcement response are just two components of a comprehensive safety plan. Columbine also changed school access and school surveillance. You have to be on a video intercom to get into a school today. McDonald is committed to making sure they never let a gunman near or in a school. Video camera, robust surveillance systems that track people's movement, panic alarms inside schools that automatically connect with our emergency dispatch center here and we are on the same radio system that all of our first responders are. And while he would not reveal the capabilities of the high-tech, high-definition surveillance system, he did demonstrate the lower resolution optics. If there's a critical incident in the school and we're locked down, our dispatchers can open a door the moment they see law enforcement pull up on scene. Remotely from here. Remotely, and that's a big deal. And he says these are safety measures for all district schools. But for Columbine High School, there are even more unique security elements that can't be discussed. For so many, it is a place of hope and inspiration. A lot of victims come here, but so too do a lot of people who are inspired by the killers. And that's been the biggest challenge for us. How many people have tried to get in the school? Um, we're averaging about 198 a month. A month. a month. 198 people a month are trying to get into school. Yeah. And what do you do? I mean, you have people there, obviously. Oh, we stop them. We engage outside the building, not inside. I'm not giving them the opportunity to get in. And McDonald says, unlike in 1999, when there were unheeded warnings about the killers being violent in their writings and conversations, today, if there are threats, whether spoken, written, or on social media, his team will react quickly. Look, if you say you're going to kill us, you say you're going to blow us up, I believe you. And we're going to send law enforcement to your house, and we're going to try to get consent to search your room from your parents. And we're going to try to bring your parents in on this and make them a partner with us because we're not going to allow this to happen. We're going to make sure that in our environment, um, you and everyone else around you are safe and secure. That is the message from a school district that has experienced mass murder. And it's a message officials here hope other districts across the country will take to heart to prevent yet another school shooting. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm John Ferrugia in Denver. Stay with us. Coming up on the NewsHour, Mark Shields and David Brooks break down President Trump's controversial comments about receiving foreign help in campaigns. Plus, how embracing the legacy of blues music is reviving a struggling southern city. But first, in Syria, there is a tale of two territories. The final stronghold of those opposed to the Assad regime is the target of relentless attacks and the source of constant tension between Syria and neighboring Turkey. And then there is the area liberated by the U.S. and its allies. As Nick Schifrin reports, each area faces unique and immense challenges. With the war in Syria now grinding into its ninth year, Bashar al-Assad has all but won the war and kept power with the help of Iran and Russia in much of the country. But the killing and suffering continues, especially in northwest Syria and Idlib province. Millions of civilians and tens of thousands of militants are under constant bombardment. Meanwhile, in northeast Syria, the Syrian Kurds, with U.S. and European backing, destroyed ISIS's stronghold nearly three months ago. The Kurds control a vast area, but many of its major cities are destroyed, and they live with the threat of a promised U.S. withdrawal.
To update us on both regions, we welcome two people with deep experience covering the war. Hassan Hassan was born and grew up in eastern Syria. He is now a director at the Center for Global Policy, a foreign policy think tank, and journalist and author Gail Tamak Leman. She's an adjunct senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations and just returned from her sixth trip to northeast Syria and is working on a new book about the Kurds. Welcome to you both. Thank you very much. Hassan Hassan, let's start with you in Idlib. We've covered this story before. How bad? is the onslaught by the Syrian regime and the Russian Air Force against this last uh, location where rebels are, are living. This is as, as bad as it gets. Uh, we were anticipating that the regime and the Russians will uh, attack uh, Idlib. Uh, we've been uh, anticipating this for about a year now. So the, the offensive has been uh, relent, uh, relentless. Uh, the uh, Russians have been bombarding the areas nonstop for about six weeks now. Uh, but with very little uh, military progress on the ground. So what is their hope? Uh, are they trying to uh, bomb these people into submission? Uh, these people don't have very many places to go other than across the border in Turkey, or, or is it more of a limited goal? The, uh, the campaign has been uh, very limited. There are signs that uh, the uh, Russians have wanted it to be uh, geographically limited. Iran has not been involved in the fight on, on the ground. And this is one of the major reasons why Russia has not managed to make any progress, meaningful progress, against the Syrian rebels uh, in Idlib and in northern Hama. Uh, these are the two areas where uh, the offensive ha has focused. It was probably they managed to take 1% and they lost around 1% as well. These horrific scenes that we're seeing in, in Idlib are not the same as we see in, in northern Syria and northeast Syria. Uh, Raqqa was ISIS's stronghold, uh, a place where there were executions in the middle of the square. The SDF, the Syrian Democratic Forces, mostly Kurds with U.S. help, have taken over that city. Is it a real city today? Does it have real problems? It, it is. It's a real city with real problems led by a non-state actor with real state issues. Right? And so what you see now is a real fragile stability. One shopkeeper we visited, I was really worried her business was going to be closed after it was very slow in December. And we walked in this time, and not only does is she have a great business that's going and a sewing machine that's up, but she has a 14-year-old girl from her family who's helping her and clerking, you know, uh, also. And so you see this real fragile stability taking hold amid enormous challenge and a real threat of ISIS reemergence. So what they're looking for is any opening that they possibly can use. And it's interesting, um, one mother we met said, you know, what we really love is that women are in all kinds of new roles all around Raqqa. What we're really worried about is the city falling back into chaos. Mm. And that's what you hear a lot. One of the big challenges also in that part of the country is what to do with the people who were either held by ISIS or were members of ISIS, especially the so-called ISIS wives. These are women who traveled with their husbands to join ISIS. How do they feel about ISIS today, and, and how are they raising their children? So it depends on who you talk to. Uh, the, the women that we spoke with, and I think that you should call them both ISIS wives and followers, right? Because they were very much adherents to what was happening. And so uh, you talk to them and you hear this mix of real disappointment and disillusionment with Baghdadi, who was the head of the Islamic State, because they are deeply bitter about the fact that children of these women who were part of ISIS died of starvation in Baghouz in the last ISIS holdout while uh, leadership had access, as one mother told me, to potato chips and, and juice and Pepsi while our children died in our arms. And you really do hear that now. At the same time, you have this United Nations of ISIS that is in this whole camp with people from Seychelles and Germany and Amsterdam and all kinds of countries, right? And you walk in and you hear a real rainbow of languages being spoken as people talk about it, and you see how far-reaching uh, this project was. And you wonder, you know, there is this camp in Hull was, had 9,000 people in a school running before Baghouz. It was prepared for 30 to 40,000. It now has 73 thousand people, at least 60 percent of them children. And they're trying to figure out what to do with this, including all of the foreigners who absolutely no one wants to take back. Because the Kurds don't have the capacity, really, to, to do big, much with them. Up until a few months ago, right? I mean, they were fighting the people. And now we've asked them to please, you know, not only house them, feed them, shelter them, make sure that viruses don't spread, you know, that the health care is taken care of, but also help us hold people that their own home countries don't want. Let's quickly look toward the future. Hassan Hassan, what do you, what do you see in, in, in Idlib? Do you think this onslaught w will continue? And are we going to see it spread past Idlib? 
Well, I think uh, both Russia and the regime will eventually want to take all of all Idlib because this is the last stronghold held by uh, the Syrian rebel forces. In my opinion, uh, the preference by the Syrian regime is to demolish the whole area. The reason why that is is because they know that even after they uh, expel the Syrian rebel forces from these areas, that will be uh, that will turn into an endless underground uh, underground campaign insurgency uh, by these forces. So they don't want to. Uh, take chances, essentially, of having some remnants of the rebels in, in that very critical area. Gail, uh, Tamak Lamont, what, what, what do you see quickly in, in north, north and, and, and northeastern Syria? These, these threats to stability, uh, do the Kurds have the capacity to prevent uh, instability, and, and is the U.S. focused enough on it? So the U.S. is the Oz-like presence that you don't see, but everybody knows. And so far, they've been able to keep out the regime. Iran Turkey, and they've been able to keep ISIS more or less at bay, with a partner force that is doing its job every single day. So the challenge is what comes next, and that has always been the question. Um, you hear, talk to SDF leadership, to, to folks who are part of this partner force, and they are focused on trying to work with the Americans to get to a deal with Turkey. They're very quick to talk to you about it. Whether that deal can be achieved is a whole other question. Gail Tamak Laman with Council on Foreign Relations, Hassan Hassan, Center for Global Policy. Thanks to you both. Thank you. Thank you. Back in the U.S., the stages are set for the first Democratic primary debates, and President Trump weighs in on accepting information from foreign governments about political opponents, which brings us to the analysis of Shields and Brooks. That is syndicated columnist Mark Shields and New York Times columnist David Brooks. Hello to both of you. So let's start with the story that has pretty much dominated the week, David, and that is President Trump saying in that interview, ABC, that if he were offered information from a foreign government about a political opponent, he wouldn't have any trouble taking it, and he, why would he report it to the FBI? Now, he's walked it back a little, yeah. but, uh, but how serious is this? Well, it's a, it's a great moment in moral philosophy when <laughs> you're asked if you're going to cheat, and you say, of course, everyone cheats. Uh, I, I salute him for not pretending to be better than he really is. He's pretty candid about it. But I do think that's a bit of his mindset, that the rules, everybody breaks the rules, and maybe he conducted his business life that way. Uh, and um, he certainly wants to do that. It's just his natural reaction is, of course, everybody breaks the rules. What's disturbing to me is not so much him, we sort of know him already, is how many Republicans are now walking themselves up to the position, well, we're in a death match, and so we need a leader like that. And I think in order to justify their support for President Trump, they've talked themselves, or many people have, into the position that this is a life or death struggle, the left is out to destroy us, and so breaking the rules is what you got to do. And so that, to me, is almost a, a scarier prospect than, than the heart and soul of Donald Trump. So some of them, some Republicans, have, to, have said that he made a mistake. Yes, but Mitt you're Romney right. and others. But, and, but some of the others, the people who are supporting him, it's the ends justify the means argument. Mark? Yeah, I, I agree with David. I, it just it strikes me that the president uh, remains unchanged in a changing world. Um, being president has not changed him in the least. Um, even Warren Harding, not a particularly thoughtful or self-reflective man, said the White House is an alchemist. It's, it finds what your strengths are, in his case, finds what your weaknesses are. Donald Trump said in that interview with George Stephanopoulos, I've heard a lot of things in my life. I've never gone to the FBI. I mean, he was talking as a New York real estate guy. He's never made the transition to, I'm thinking, is it good for the United States of America? Is it good for the working families? Is it good for world peace or whatever? Uh, that a president is supposed to think through that prism. It comes right down to, is it good for me? And uh, with David's point, hey, hey, get a little advantage over my, uh, my opponent. Uh, yeah, you better believe I'll do it. Uh, what am I, a sissy, a snitch that's going to go to the FBI? Uh, and it's, it's a... You know, it really is sort of a sad moral judgment. The other thing I just point out is ABC. It was ABC's story, and ABC today broke the the uh, they revealed the Trump state polls at this point. Um, and uh, I don't know if you saw that, but he is now trailing 
Joe Biden by 16 points in Pennsylvania, uh, by 10 points in Wisconsin, by seven points in Florida. So, I mean, the, we're looking at the cusp right now, given those kind of numbers of a campaign that literally would do anything. Which the president, when he was asked about those polls the other day, said that that's not correct. That's that right. his, poll, his polls show that he's ahead in every state. And these are his polls that have been revealed <laughs> today. But, yeah. but David, to your point about Republicans being on board. I mean, the fact is you have mainly Republicans holding up efforts in the Congress right now to tighten election security. So this is this is having some consequence here. Yeah, and this is Mitch McConnell. And, you know, frankly, I don't, you know, the, the, the federal government has already authorized $380 million for the states. One of the bills would give them another billion. And so I don't really know what the right spending level for this, but you would think, given what we've been through and the seriousness of what we've been through, that you'd want to err on the side of preventing the corruption of our electoral system, uh, which has happened, which we know was going to happen again from multiple sources, maybe. The Russians doing something different than they did last time. And so you'd think you'd, if we're going to spend um, whatever, hundreds and hundreds of billions on defense, on our military defense, uh, a billion on our, to defend our, our electoral system doesn't seem to me an outrageous expense. And so it seems like something they should be doing. And you get the impression Mitch McConnell doesn't want to do anything that will annoy Donald Trump. Yeah, Mitch McConnell has been constant on this. He's no Johnny come lately. He was the one voice, you recall, in the leadership in 2016 when the leadership of the Congress unanimously agreed with the Obama administration to go public uh, on the uh, on the revelation that Russia was already uh, deeply involved in the systematic uh, undermining of our electoral process. He resisted it and, and as a consequence, stopped it. Uh, he is now stopping the reforms. I mean, even uh, Roy Blunt, uh, the chairman of the Rules Committee, has been quite candid about this. I mean, the, the fact is that if, you know, in, a, in a secular democracy, the closest thing to a public sacrament is a national election. Uh, and uh, you know, when you're starting to tamper with that and trifle with that, I mean, we went through it in, in 2016. 16. We saw what happened uh, when uh, when there was strife and, and disunity uh, nurtured in the Democratic side between Sanders and uh, and the Clinton campaigns uh, by uh, by those emails. Uh, party chair was forced out, and and Donald Trump himself 140 times mentioned. WikiLeaks, uh, right. uh, approvingly during the campaign. I mean, so th th there was a play, and, and the Mueller report uh, committee uh, uh, investigation confirmed it. But at this point, not m nothing is really moving that would no. that would change Thanks that would to protect Mitch. that would protect what we've gone on. Mark, you mentioned the 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 polls. Uh, the Democrats probably brought a little spring to their step, but we know these polls are temporary. Today, uh, David, the Democratic National Committee announced. They've got their first debates coming up next week, and they're divided into two nights because there are so many candidates. The Democrats, uh, the party, said, okay, the most we're going to allow on the stage on any one night is 10. So they've got 10 one night and 10 the next. Today they drew names, and we can show you the lineup now. On the first night, June the 26th, uh, they're going to be these 10. I'm not going to name every mm -hmm. single one of them, yep. but I can tell you that this is a, Elizabeth Warren is included here, Beto O'Rourke, and then the others, Cory Booker and Amy Klobuchar and a number of others. The second night, you have, um, frankly, several of the front runners, Joe mm -hmm. Biden, Bernie Sanders, Pete Buttigieg, uh, Kamala Harris, and others. Does this, is this a lineup, uh, David, that tells you something about what we can look for or what? I mean, the party was clearly trying to not to have a, an adult night yeah. and a kid's night. Right. Now, and it's 10. It's a, a, a minion. So it's an honor to tradition <laughs> to get the minion of Democrats. Um, uh, yeah, I think the short answer, I don't know. The first thing is it's bad for Elizabeth Warren because the better night is the second night. Uh, you got Biden, Buttigieg, uh, you've got Sanders, you've got three of the, the top tier, and then some of the wild cards who... We will, and as well as Kamala Harris. So if you, people are going to watch one night, I suspect they're going to watch night two. But of course, we'll all be watching both nights. Both nights. Um, yeah. uh, and so that the second thing is, in hearing from the campaigns, is usually going to a debate with some um, strategy, like who you're going to say what to. But yeah. with so many, there's no strategy. You, it's just. Um, there's no, you can't pick a strategy because you don't know where, what's going to happen. There'll be 10 of the people on the stage. Two then, hours each night. And then it'll be yeah. another 10 the next night or some other time. And so it'll be a little more parallel play, I think, with the candidates not trying to react so much to each other, but just trying to shine their own solipsic self. <laughs> All right. Match solipsis. Their own solipsis. Solipsis. Oh, wow. <laughs>
boy, that's a PBS word. <laughs> yeah. But Mark, I mean, does this does this lineup foretell something special about this, or is it, it just there's so many? It does, Judy. <laughs> and I'll tell you what it says: if you're going in at your two, three percent. Um, th this is your night. I mean, you've got to say something that's memorable. That, that's what it is. Now, that, that is maybe good news for a candidate, maybe bad news for the party. Uh, you know, I'm going to make the boldest uh, assertion. I'm going to take um, a, a position that's far out to the left and challenge everybody else to do it. Um, you know, but I have to do something that's memorable. I, I want to bell the cat. I want to go after Joe Biden or one of the front runners or, or Elizabeth Warren in the first night. Um, I, I would say Elizabeth Warren's probably got the best position because she ha has the first night. Not a curiosity. A lot of people mm -hmm. will uh, will turn in. But uh, no, I, I think um, I, I think that's the that's the risk. And, and plus, it's the reward. I mean, you do something that's memorable. I remember 1988, the Democrats, the seven dwarfs, uh, nine dwarfs, or whatever they were then, when Bruce Babbitt, who was a dark horse, the governor of Arizona, st stood up and said, uh, we're going to have to raise taxes. We know that after Ronald Reagan. And I know we're going to, and I'll, I'll do it as president, and I'll stand up, and I, you know, challenge the rest of you to do it. And they all, all the others sat down. And of course, he was right. He was the only one. He was yeah. the only one who did, did it. Get the but... nomination. I'm trying to remember. No, he didn't get the nomination. <laughs> but I mean, but though you have to do something to in roll order, the dice to get to get the yeah. attention. Yeah. And because the good, the, the go good news for the Democrats, I, sh I left out a syllable from solipsistic. Yeah, by the way. yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> but um, Mark and I noticed that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I didn't want to say anything. The, the good news for the Democrats is all these people qualified. Because they all, you had to get, what was it, 65,000? 65, 65, that's right. Uh, and be at least at uh, X percent. And of so you have right. all these people, some of them not so well known, they all did it. Right. And that's a sign that Democratic interest is super high and that we could be seeing uh, exponentially record turnout. Um, either through the primaries or maybe through the whole year. I'm, I'm expecting we're going to have a huge uh, viewership of yeah. both on, of both nights. Are you really? Okay. Uh, but but Mark, um, you you mentioned uh, the candidates having a chance to to stand out. Um, they are there are a few of them who are now t beginning to take shots or mini shots, I guess we can say, at the front runner mm -hmm. Joe Biden. Last night I interviewed Beto O'Rourke here, and he took what I'm what I think you can say is a gentle swipe at uh, at uh, the former vice president. Okay. Listen. I think some of the appeal of the vice president's candidacy is a return to a, an earlier era. And while we are grateful for that era and certainly for the service of, of President Obama, I think we need to be focused on the future because even before Donald Trump, we had challenges in this country. Even before President Trump, we had challenges. Yes, that, that's true. I, I don't think anyone's going to argue with that. <laughs> um, uh, nostalgia isn't what it used to be. Uh, that's that's the Beto O'Rourke uh, bumper sticker. I mean, I, I can understand that. I, th I think more than anything else, it was a subtle, um, non-venomous way of raising the age issue. Yeah. Uh, that uh, Joe Joe Biden is yesterday. I'm tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow basically wins in American politics. I think today might be an exception when yesterday looks pretty darn good to most Americans. Is that effective for him to be doing that? Yeah, and, well, and, I think he's not the only one. Substantively, there is an argument whether the Democrats want to continue on the Obama-Biden trajectory or they want a totally different trajectory. And Sanders, Warren, and maybe Beto are sort of on a different trajectory. I personally don't think it's effective to do it right now. Yeah. I, I think the, the Democrats, even in, with all these good poll numbers, are terrified of blowing this. <laughs> And they do not want to sully each other too much. I think there's going to be low market, especially early in the campaign, to sully the other candidates. Second, people like Joe Biden. Uh, and so there's some expectation from some of the other campaigns that he's just going to fade on his own, or they hope he will. But anyway, to go out so early and to be negative, even if it was pretty it gentle. Was, it was a pretty gentle. It was pretty negative. gentle. I mean, but I, 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 would, I would make just a larger point yeah. that I think the going after each other as heavily and as hard as Sanders and Clinton did, or as Obama and Clinton did, I think that's probably the wrong formula this year. And, and that's my question, Mark. I mean, is that the kind of thing that we're going to look at, look for uh, in these debates next week? How hard are they going to go? Are they going to be prepared? We, we, we will say we're looking for substance and new ideas, <laughs> but we will look for elbows and, and knees yeah. and the groin and, and all sorts of, uh, you know, rabbit punches and, and, and that, and uh, whether, in fact, they're rewarded for it. I mean, I, I think, I mean, I, I think the, the urgency, the sense of urgency that you've got to break through uh, in, the, in one of those appearances is, is just, is, is so strong and so compelling, overwhelming.
And, and uh, this week we saw, uh, David, we saw Bernie Sanders talk about democratic socialism. He's clearly feeling some heat uh, from maybe not so much from Democrats, although they've expressed their differences, but also from Republicans. Uh, is that something he needs to do right now? Yeah, I've certainly heard it from Democrats <laughs> that we're not all socialists. We don't want to be the socialist party. I don't think he helped himself at all. I mean, he didn't describe what kind of socialist he is. He's just a socialist who wants to continue the New Deal. I wouldn't call that socialism. The key issue is what, what do you think of capitalism and how much would you interfere in the market? Elizabeth Warren makes very clear she's got some pretty progressive policies, but she wants to reform capitalism, not do away with it. And Sanders is never able to define the left where he won't go. Uh, whether it's Venezuela or whether it's the Nicaraguan regime, the Sandinistas, he'll never say, those people are not me. And so without drawing that boundary, Trump can say, look, he's as socialist as you want to be. So I don't think he did a very good job of defining what he means by socialism. Well, he'll have a chance to do that next Thursday night on the debate stage. Mark Shields, David Brooks, we'll be talking about that next Friday. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Judy. And now, a music festival attempting to keep the blues alive in the Mississippi Delta and revive a struggling town. Jeffrey Brown reports it's part two of our, or part, I should say, of our arts and culture series, Canvas, and our look at American creators. <laughs> A rainy Saturday night in Clarksdale, in the heart of the rural Mississippi Delta. At the new seed and supply company, Anthony Big A. Sherrod is holding court. It was just one act in a town-wide celebration of the blues that for 16 years has been bringing thousands of fans here, rain or shine, each spring. It's wonderful, man. It's lovely. Love, love, they love the blues, just like I do. They came from all around the country and all over the world, including this contingent from Australia. This year, the festival featured more than 100 performances. For the kids, there were racing pigs and a monkey riding a dog herding goats. The festival takes its name from juke joints, informal bars and music venues once scattered throughout the African-American South as an answer in part to whites-only clubs. A rich history now in danger of being lost. Red's Lounge is said to be one of the last true juke joints in Clarksdale, and on a Friday night was packed as Frank Rimmer dazzled on guitar. See, I was keeping it a secret. <laughs> I don't know, somehow it got out. Yeah. Red Patton has been running this place for more than 40 years. So why do you think people are coming here from all over the world? They keep coming. They heard I was a mean son of a bitch. <laughs> That's what that is. No, really. Why are they coming to well, Clarksdale? Why are they coming to Red? Well, it tells a story, man. And a lot of them have gone through certain things, you know, but didn't know how to express themselves. So in that music, they've learned how to express themselves. Clarksdale sits at a very famous crossroads of blues history, where Route 61, which runs from New Orleans to Memphis, St. Louis, and beyond, meets Route 49, which runs across Mississippi. And it's where, according to lore, blues legend Robert Johnson sold his soul to the devil to learn the guitar. It's home to the Riverside Hotel on the south side of town, where singer Bessie Smith died after a car accident. And it was once home to legends like Muddy Waters, Sam Cooke, Ike Turner, and many more. That's me, I'm Roger. Juke Joint so Festival co-founder oh, Roger yeah. Stoley grew up in Ohio as a so fan of the music time. and moved here in 2002 to mm -hmm. open Cathead, a record store. He says the downtown then was dead and live music was struggling to be heard. It was just really winding down. You could almost just see it winding down. So it's kind of like, well, you make it reliable, I can bring you tourists, blues fans. But they're not going to spend the night in Clarksdale if I can't promise them you've got music tonight. Today, there are new cafes, restaurants, hotels. 
and live music across town, including at many new venues like Ground Zero Blues Club, co-owned by actor Morgan Freeman. Economic challenges remain, but cultural tourism has been a major factor in the growth. You could fire a cannon down the street and not hit anyone. John Henshaw is an economist based in Melbourne, Australia. He first passed through here in 2001 by accident and has since returned 22 times. Now he's written a book about its downtown redevelopment and lessons for other small cities. Well, to have something you can authentically promote. In this case, it's the blues. Something real. Yeah. Something real. Yeah. And it's not just the music, but, but it's certainly the blues. That's one of the lessons. You've got to promote it. You've got to get people engaged. And increasingly, the Clark's Dahlians themselves are now recognising what they have here. You mean they didn't before? They grew up with it. They didn't realise that it's something that could be so appealing to people beyond the city limits. In a majority black area, those visitors are overwhelmingly white, as are many of the new businesses. And the challenge here is to make sure the benefits are spread evenly. A lot of people depend on the festival, you know, in Clarksdale because of the economy. Archie Buford is owner of Our Grandma's House of Pancakes, one of a number of new downtown establishments, but one of the few black-owned. What we got to work on is making sure what we do inside the fence gets outside to better the community. The better the community, the better the city. He's getting it all, all at the night venue. Festival sure. co-founder Roger Stoley. But you know what it is? It's the first puzzle piece on that empty table, and it was an absolutely empty table. And the thing about puzzle pieces is you can build off of that. So now you look at it, there's the obvious things like, okay, well, we got live blues 365 nights a year, which we do. We have a dozen festivals a year, which we do. And it just, it reverberates. It may not save the town obviously on its own, but it's sort of the foundation of, of what we're doing, at least for downtown revitalization. It's a hope for the music and for the economic benefits it can bring. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Jeffrey Brown in Clarksdale, Mississippi. Tonight, PBS American Masters presents Terrence McNally, Every Act of Life, a documentary on one of the nation's leading playwrights and writer of the Broadway musical, The Full Monty. I was in a prep school, and my first play that I did was Next by Terrence McNally. And I remember by the end of the play, I was in tears. I couldn't even finish the play. Um, and... And the lights went down, and, and, and I just felt very raw. And I felt like, wow, I guess that's, that's what acting is. I went by the theater one night, and I saw Patrick Wilson on a Gershwin review. And I thought, this guy is really great, and we're casting Full Monty. The characters in Full Monty, to me, represent everybody who's got some gumption and wants to better themselves. This show was as much about life and love and not taking anybody for granted. Um, as any show that I've ever been a part of. That's American Masters tonight on PBS. And that is the news hour for tonight. On Monday, we will talk with Democratic presidential candidate Julian Castro. And earlier with Shields and Brooks, I said the Democratic debates are next week. They are actually in two weeks. I was in too big a hurry. We will be here to analyze it all. I'm Judy Woodruff. Have a great weekend. Thank you and good night. Major funding for the people. PBS.